Hi again, I'm Jack Lissenberry, and welcome or welcome back to Politics and Prejudices, the podcast. This is sort of an evolution of the column I wrote and the radio commentaries I did for many years, so I hope you enjoy and keep listening. You can also catch up with my writing and any essays and podcasts you might have missed on my website and blog, LessonberryInc.com. It's ink as an ink pen. We have an especially important topic today, so please settle back and listen and stay tuned afterwards for my signature essay. I hope you enjoy. If you do, please go to my website and subscribe. It's the right price, absolutely free. And now for our, pro- our topic today, women who shouldn't be in prison and the effort of a few dedicated people to free them. The vast majority of Michigan state prisoners are men. Women inmates are all housed in a single prison, the Huron Valley Correctional Facility near Ann Arbor, which has been plagued with problems from overcrowding, the sanitation, and mold issues. Some of these women were dangerous criminals, but an appalling number of them were sentenced to being sentenced to long terms, often to life, for crimes they were forced into by people, often abusive boyfriends or husbands, with, uh, with whom they were victims in abusive relationships. Some were convicted of murder for killing their abusers, often to save their own lives or those of their children. And for more than 20 years, Carol Jacobson, now the director of the Michigan's Women's Clemency Project, has waged a sometimes lonely struggle to get the authorities to see the injustice of these cases. Incidentally, she's not a social worker or criminologist by training, but a professor of art and a documentary filmmaker who became aware of this issue while working on a film. We're fortunate enough to have her in the studio with us today, and with her is Michelle Pearson, who accidentally shot a woman during a robbery her boyfriend forced her to commit when she was only 17. She had to serve for 34 years in prison. She was finally released on parole a year ago last August, partly due to the help of the Michigan Women's Clemency Project. And joining us by phone is Anita Posey, who was a dedicated caseworker for the Michigan Department of Social Services for many years. But her boyfriend was abusive and an addict, and one day she ended up killing him to save the life of her 14-month-old son. She served 15 years in prison before being paroled, again with the help of the Clemency Project. Um, Carol, uh, Michelle, Professor Jacobson, thank you very much for coming, and welcome to our podcast. Thank you, Jack. Glad to be here. So, thank uh, you. Thank you all. Um, tell us a little bit, Carol, about the Michigan Women's Clemency Projects, what is, how it works, who it tries to help, kind of how it functions. Well, we have a four-point mission, really. Uh, first of all, we're seeking to free women wrongly convicted who are serving life sentences or long sentences and uh, uh, who acted in self-defense in one form or another because of the violence in their lives and abuse they were suffering. Um, And second, we also monitor and report human rights abuses, report to the media, to the ACLU, to the governor, and so on. And there are lots of abuses that go on against the women that are incarcerated in Huron Valley, which is Michigan's state prison for women. If I remember correctly, Michelle Pearson, that happened to you. If I remember correctly, you were raped by a prison guard. Yes, I was. Um, I was hospitalized, paralyzed from my eyeballs down. Um, I had been up walking like two days, and he raped me. I now have a 23-year-old son. Hmm. Are you in contact with your son at all? No. Um, I've seen pictures of him on his Facebook or what right. have you. But he's not ready to meet up with me. I haven't seen him since he was five. Now, was that was that guard punished? He was given two years probation. He pleaded guilty. They gave him two years probation. Um, he was ordered to pay me a large sum of money via him or the state, and neither is paid it. Um, Anita Posey, um, did you suffer? Did you suffer human rights violations when you were in prison? No, not really. But, I uh, I was forty years old when I entered the system. So uh, I was a bit more mature and aware of my rights, and I just wasn't having it. Well, how were, you, how were you treated overall? Overall, I was treated with great respect. Well, I think I that, that's good, but did you feel, did you feel, Anita Posey, that you belonged in prison? Absolutely not. But, uh, could you tell us just a little about, about the circumstances that, that led you there and what you were convicted of? Well, I had moved from Detroit because of the violence and to Lansing and thought I was with the man of my dreams who treated me like a queen. But once I professed my love for him after a year, he decided to start putting his hands on me. I had no experience with abuse before and didn't know how to handle it. 
I left him four times, but one night I was faced with a kill or be killed situation, and I wasn't ready to die. And so I think, after he had put his hands on me hmm. and my child, um, that was it. Um, well, did you plead self-defense? I tried to, but my attorney convinced me that I didn't stand a chance in Shalott, which was the county seat of Eaton County, being a black woman. And he convinced me that I should plead guilty to second-degree murder. Um, and, and you ended up serving 14 years? Yes, 14 years, 9 months, 7 days, and 18 hours. I think you were counting. But did you interact with the Michigan's Women's Clemency Projects while you were in there? Yes, I did. Tell us I about that a little her. bit. I found out about the Clemency Project shortly after my uh, incarceration, about two years in, and I contacted Carol, and she filed a petition for me while Ingler was still in office. And, of course, I was denied. It was Governor and John Ingler. He was there until 2003, I think. Yeah. Correct. And then, again, with Granholm, which I thought she was going to definitely grant it, especially in her campaign speeches, where she promised to protect women and children in Michigan. So I just knew that was going to go through. But once again, I was denied. Hmm. And how did you finally get paroled? I served my time. So you, you, got, you, just, you served your time, and uh, you did not really get out early. No, I didn't. Actually, I got out a year late. Uh, when I went to the parole board for the first time, they denied me and made me serve almost another year, saying that I was a continued threat. And I went to see the parole board in a wheelchair. So I don't know who I was a threat to at that time. Hmm. Michelle Pearson, could you tell us a little bit about your story? Um, as I said, my mom died when I was like 10 or 11 years old. Mm -hmm. um, I have a younger sister and brother who I was raising, and my young brother is who I had parole to when I came home. Same scenario, met a guy that's like five years older than me, thought he was my knight in shining armor. Year into the relationship, he started beating me, putting my head through windows, burning me, cutting me. You were a teenager at the time. Um, when I met him, I was 13. 13. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, unbeknownst to me, he had a criminal background. Right. Um, very jealous, very possessive. He became a drug user, very avid. Um, the night that him and his brother decided they needed money to get their drugs, I was given the option of, you're going to go with us and do an armed robbery, or we're going to kill your six-year-old brother. Well, I made a promise to my mom that I would protect my sister and brother, so right. I chose to take my brother to a safe place, and I went with them. Um, I was told to ask my victim his favor for a ride, and I did. And when I pulled the gun out to show her that I was being forced to rob her, she was shot in her neck. So the gun went off by accident? Yes. And she died? Yes. Mm. She was kept on life support, I think, until the day or two before Thanksgiving, and then she passed on. And so what were you convicted of? Um, I was actually convicted of first-degree murder, felony firearm, and armed robbery. They vacated the armed robbery and charged me with the gun and the murder. And how, what was your sentence? Um, I was sentenced to life without parole. Hmm. Now, um, Carol Jacobson, did you work actively on her case? Yes, I did, from 92 until she was released in 2018. Hmm. Yes. But how, did, how did they get, how did the life without possibility of parole get uh, knocked down? Because she was 17 mm -hmm. when she was convicted. So she was a juvenile with life without parole, and because of Miller versus Alabama, this was the U.S. Supreme Court case. U.S. Supreme case. Court case. Uh, she was retried in Washtenaw County. Well, reheard, I should right. say. And uh, I talked to the prosecutor over and over. <laughs> and so did one of the jurors on Michelle's case, who really has been her friend all these years also, Carol Peacock. And so together we just kept trying to twist the arm of the prosecutor, and uh, he finally was willing to give her uh, a sentence of years, which, um, and she had a few years of good time behavior before good time behavior was canceled, banned in Michigan by Governor Engler, 
And uh, that made a difference because she was able then to get out for time served after 32? 34. 34 years. 34 years. years. And um, it was way too much time. The sentencing project, national sentencing project, says Michigan is number three in the country for uh, the longest sentences. So, uh, and there are so many women in, um, like Anita, who, you know, acted in self-defense, face-to-face combat with a boyfriend or husband, and and defended themselves and are serving life sentences or, you know, 40 years or 50. And there is no time off for good behavior in Michigan. So that is a real uh, injustice for these women who were not able to raise issues of self-defense, issues of abuse, um, or if it was raised, it wasn't effective and there was not enough education. And there still isn't. I sit through parole hearing after parole hearing with some women who have sentences of years right. who get parole hearings. And, uh, I mean, I just sat through the, the most recent, I guess, was Linda Markhart this past summer. And she had a sentence of eight, 17 years. And um, she killed her violent boyfriend in self-defense. And, uh, of course, the first time she went to the parole board, they turned her down like they did Anita Posey. Um, And that's typical. The parole board never lets anybody out on their first time around. (laughs) They just keep you on to see if you'll be upset or anything. (laughs) And and then they'll keep you longer. Uh, But... Uh, finally, I went to I went to her second hearing with her, and uh, and she just she just got out, um, but she uh, also killed her her husband in self defense. And we we have right now twelve women first degree lifers that are meant to die in prison because life means life in Michigan, and you don't get out and. Uh, these women all either acted in face-to-face combat and or they were with a boyfriend who killed somebody and they were there so they also as accessories uh, got life in prison. So I think the average person listening to Michelle Pearson's case, listening to Anita Posa case, case would think, well, you know, it's horrible these women spent so much time in prison, maybe horrible spent any time in prison, but these are not aberrations. There's a lot of other no. cases similar. That's right. There are uh, well over 100. Um, There are uh, over 400 women in serving time for first or second degree murder. And, uh, you know, many of them shouldn't be there at all. Maybe they should serve some time. In some cases. Yeah, yeah, in some cases. But not the... And, you know, I mean, we know we have heard a lot, thank goodness, about how racist our criminal legal system is. But we do not hear much about how sexist our criminal legal system is. And it is. It's biased. I, as I said, have sat through so many parole hearings and many public hearings now for lifers. And uh, there no, has it gotten better that we have changed no, the law? It's not, it's not, no, it's not better at all. No, because the parole board is made up of former police officers and corrections officers, and people in the Michigan Department of Corrections. And so they have no interest. They have a vested interest in keeping people in prison, as a matter of but fact. But in the trials themselves, aren't there, isn't there more latitude for battered women? Aren't there more defenses that they can claim? It, they, they don't work. work. They, they don't really work. don't work. Don't that work. law does not work. The, the law allowing expert testimony doesn't seem to work at all for women. No. Mm. Mm. And... So, um, and some scholars have said that overturning these battered women's cases is one of the hardest kinds of cases to overturn. I mean, think about it. There is no innocence project for right. these women. There is no silver bullet in terms of a DNA because they committed the crime or they were with somebody who right. committed the right. crime. But the the fact that they were under duress or that they were protecting themselves or their kids does not count at all, and it should. But Michelle, was, as I 
you were essentially a prisoner in a way. I mean, you didn't have any choice. You were compelled to do this. Um, and you were 17 years old. You were a minor. minor. At the, Anita Posey, let me, I'd like to ask you something that I've wondered about. How do you, how do you keep your sanity and your equilibrium in prison? <laughs> That's a very good question. I ask myself that often. Um, now, don't get me wrong. I didn't float on the glory clouds singing the Hallelujah Chorus 24-7. There were some difficult days in there. But as I said, um, when I was incarcerated, I was 40 years old, had lived life as, as an adult, had a career with the state. So I knew my rights. I, I had enough sense to dig into policy and procedure and I demanded my rights. And that was met with some resistance from some. Uh, there were some that did not uh, treat me as respectfully as I had hoped, but there were quite a few that did. Um, it was difficult because I felt like the abuse was being perpetuated because I was in another controlled and isolating environment. And uh, go ahead. I'm just wondering. So, how long how long has it been since you were since you got out? I got out in 2012. Oh, so you've had some. So, what are you doing now, if I may ask? Right now, I'm an administrative assistant for the Homeless Action Network of Detroit mm. for the Homeless Management Information System team, and I was very fortunate to get that job uh, through the executive director, who is also a minister at my church. Well, that's great. Well, your son was 14 months old when you went to prison. Do um, you have a relationship with him now? Well, he was actually five. I didn't I'm sorry. go for four years, but uh, he was 20 years old when I got out. And that was a challenging relationship because he didn't know me. He knew of me. You know, he had, right. he had come to visit me a few times, but he had gone with his um, birth father and stayed with his family. And they thought it was best that he not visit me for behavioral reasons. So we were kept apart forcefully by his dad's family. And that was unfortunate. Mm. But, but do you have a relationship with him now? Have things improved? Oh, yes, absolutely. Mm. Because the son that I had that was 12 when I went to move to Lansing passed in 2014 at the age of 40. And he sad. felt he had to step up and... Uh, in the gap. And now he's a father and married, and I interact with him and his wife and child and his other two children hmm. very much. But, uh, well, you've, been, you've been a very courageous person. Uh, Michelle Pearson, what I'm wondering, um, you went in at 17. Yes. You came out at 51. And 52. Age 52. And so essentially, you spent all your adult life in prison. Yes. And the world, we we're talking a little bit before the show started, you went in. It was like a time machine. You were in a, went into a world with pay phones on the wall, no cell phones, and nobody ever heard of the Internet. And right. uh, nobody, you know, and uh, you came out. Did they, did they give you any preparation for the world you were going to find when you came out? No, they told me um, <clears throat> before I was released that there were people out here connected to the state that would help me with housing, that would help me adapt mentally, emotionally. And I got out here and found out I was running into a brick wall. Right. So these promises didn't materialize. No, the information that they're giving women that, whether short or long term, that's coming out is not valid at all. It it should be voided. This may be a naive and stupid question, but how'd you survive? Oh, um, I, I stayed busy. I stayed in school. I worked out. You know, but then, like Anita, I wasn't on the hallelujah cloud, but I believed in prayer. Mm-hmm. You know, so on, on my worst days, I knew how to put my music in. I knew how to go to church. I knew how to pray. You know, I knew how to walk that yard. I knew how to exercise. You know, I had people, some of the other lifers and long timers that I would really bond with. And we would go out on the yard or to the gym and talk. We would cry together. You know, me, Anita, she kind of became my mom. So if I just need to cry, I could go to her door and be like, mom, I need to cry and lean on her. So, wow. Which is good. I have to say, yeah. though, uh, through the years, there has been no bigger advocate inside the prison <laughs> than Michelle Pearson. I mean, I couldn't believe she she lost jobs in the prison for talking to police about a suicide that the wow. prison refused to. They wanted to cover up. Cover, yeah. yeah, they covered it up. They didn't 
uh, they didn't report it to the police against, and that's against the law. And um, you know, Michelle told me, reported to me, and I reported to the Free Press, and it was in the papers. And then the police contacted me and contacted Michelle. Um, and Michelle was on top of the abuses. I mean, the abuses, you know, uh, since since Anita got out, it has gone so downhill in that prison. The prison is a hellhole. I mean, the mold is horrible. Ten, eleven women, ten or eleven women uh, died last women, year. Twelve women passed within... 90 days of me being released. Oh, it's and, way over capacity, too. Isn't oh, it? Yes. yes. Terrible. 2,300 women at least, maybe And that's more. not counting the ones that have passed since I've been home. Yeah. The conditions are outrageous It's a there. facility built for about 1,100 people, so there's twice no, as many. You know, it started out at, like, a capacity of two or 300. Mm. And when I started there, that's how many women were right. there, 237 women or something yeah. in... 1989, 90. That's when, when you were first, making a film and you first went when in. When I first right. went in. And that's how many women were in there. Now there's 2,300. And so they're just on top of each other. It's it's horrendous conditions. And the abuses are terrible. We're hearing a lot about lawsuits by the guards. They can't even stand it in there. A lot because, of them quit. Yeah. And now, so, now, you brought this to the attention of the people who... The legislature, people who make policy? Yes. And what kind of response have, do you get? W and not much, and we don't get any response for, 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 you know, for changes in the laws that are positive. They just seem to keep passing laws to punish more. Now, we now have a governor, another way a governor, a, a governor who also is a woman, who has yeah. experience in the legislature, yeah. unlike Governor Granholm. We have great hope for talked her. Talked about reform. Now, we, what we haven't mentioned is the, that... You know, there's sort of a, a quick way to get these women out. If you can get the governor, the governors can commute their sentences. The governors, right. the governor could sign a piece of paper today and get uh, the women on your list out of prison. That's right. And how has that worked? And you've appealed to governors at least uh, for how long? Back at least Engler, if not before. Yes, since uh, since the early '90s. Yes, and, um, and Engler didn't release any, despite commitments. And uh, and um, Granholm released ten women who had life sentences, so that was that was hopeful. And uh, then then Snyder, who made commitments to me, um, released only one mm. of our list. Of, In eight years, uh, he than, released only one. Yeah, one. He he released actually two women. One was ours. Uh, we represented and plus another woman who uh, had life sentences. But otherwise, um, that was it. And has so, Governor Whitmer released anybody yet? She's only been in office no, a year. right, right. And, you know, mostly governors wait until they're about to leave office before they grant clemencies, although not always. I mean, Kentucky's governor just, and oh, I think Oklahoma's governor just released some mm -hmm. people. Uh, and so we have hopes that Governor Whitmer, who seems to be really tuned into domestic violence issues, may have an understanding of this issue, unlike the parole board, unlike the, um, you know, uh, assistant attorney general who hears public hearings. Um, and she may be willing to grant some clemencies, we hope to some of these women who've served long sentences already and who pose no threat to anyone because they were representing, or, you know, were defending their kids and them, their own lives. Um, Do you, say, you say we. Tell us a little bit about the Michigan Women's Clemency Network. I mean, you're the public face of it, but how many folks work with you? Well, I work with Lynn Dorio, who's an attorney, and we have another attorney who's a volunteer with us. Um, and that's it. We're really a very grassroots ish effort. Um, but then the women themselves, I mean, we work with the women themselves who are inside mm. and a few like Michelle and Anita who are outside, who are, um, you know, uh, talking to the public about our project. And, um, tell us just a little bit about, you give me a list of 11 women here. Tell mm -hmm. us just a little bit about a couple of the cases. Well, uh, let's see. 
Luann Zanet is, uh, has served 32 years now for a murder um, committed by a friend who was an employee of hers um, to protect her and her daughter. Her, her husband had been a violent guy and um, threatened her life, and, and actually she was afraid for her daughter, too, because he had kidnapped her. Her daughter, she was in a process of divorce. And um, so she agreed with this employee to have him killed, and he he did. He shot him, shot her husband, and she's doing life. Now she maybe you know, some would feel that she should serve time, but I don't think 32 years is... is a long time. Yeah, because there was no evidence of abuse presented at trial, nothing in her defense at all. And so she really had an unfair trial. She had unfair, she had uh, ineffective uh, representation. Absolutely, now, absolutely. Now Nancy Seaman is a name. Yes. people in Detroit area know. And and Nancy Seaman's judge, like a couple of other judges, um, worked with us for years. Ever since she was sentenced to life, because she was convicted in by a jury of right. first degree. Um, and she was in face-to-face -face combat with her husband. And, you know, she picked up an axe in the garage when he had her on the floor, tackled her, and uh, swung it at him and, and killed him. And she's doing life. And her judge has been working with us all these years until he died this past uh, That's incredible. Years, in some of these cases, ago. the judges, the sentencing judges, yeah. said this is too harsh. You yeah. have people on the jury saying we made a mistake. and. Still, they're in there. That's right. Hmm. They're yeah. So it's really difficult to get these women out once they are in there. They're really locked in, and and even judges that sentence them can't can't seem to help. And uh, Judge uh, Norman Lippitt also worked long and hard for years with us. And so did former Governor Milliken. N yes, he Michigan's did. His longest serving yes. governor, a big supporter of your cause. Yes, he did. Yeah. And um, we miss him because he was really, he was very instrumental in helping us get clemencies from Governor Granholm and uh, pushing for releases. Uh, I'd like and, to interject here. Pardon me, Anita? Yes, I'd like to interject something. Sure. My appeals attorney told me once, she said, Anita, what you have to understand is the bench is manned mostly by men. And yeah. it's like the good old boys network. And they take offense when one of us kills one of them. And they feel that when men commit a crime, it's like boys will be boys. But girls are supposed to be sugar and spice and everything nice. <laughs> so when a woman does something, she's maniacal. She's just devious. And she needs to be removed from society. But there's some tough women judges, too. There are tough, some tough women judges who are tough on women, are there not? Yes, there are. I've, yes. You know, I've sat in court. Uh, watching, for example, Nancy Grant, and she is she is too tough. She is really um, has no heart at all for a, a seventeen year old girl who was with an abusive guy who committed the murder, and that girl was scared to death and uh, and was yeah. Well, we Just know we, it, it's, it's sort of a biological fact that we don't have all of our judgment powers at age 17. Your brain isn't fully That's right. full, fully formed. And, That's uh, right. I'd hate to be judged by anything I did at 17. Yeah, no but, kidding. So, so, so tell us, if people hearing us are sympathetic, if they, want, if they want to help Carol Jacobson, what can they do? They can write the governor and, um, and urge her to grant some clemencies for battered women who defended themselves. Do you have a website where they can go yes. find out more? Tell us the address. www.umich.edu slash tilde clemency. So you can look it up. You can just look up. You know, probably do clemency a, and Michigan and women, do a Google, and that'll get... Do a Google yeah. search, and it'll pop, it, yeah. it, it, it'll pop up. Yeah. So. We're based at the University of Michigan, because mm -hmm. that's where I teach. That's uh, that's great. Michelle Pearson, anything yes. you want to add that we haven't covered? Um, <clears throat> I'm just hoping that society and more people like you will become aware of the statistics of women being incarcerated, why they're incarcerated, and if, if I can say, I was recently at a meeting with one of... 
um, Governor Whitmore's right-hand guys. And I discussed the case with him of someone that I'm very close to that killed her husband, and she was protecting herself and her husband. And a promise was made. You know, have it sent personally to me. We will review it, and that promise still has not stood because they feel like women are inferior when it comes to the justice system, and it's not fair. You know, I've watched women come in there that are still healing, that are still traumatized. So, you know, Carol knows that I work with a lot of organizations that for restorative justice, and our whole goal is to try and get life without parole abolished, especially since they've raised the age to 18. Right. And I just hope that society will will coincide with us and say, give women a chance. Give these kids a chance. Allow them to correct their errors, come out and be productive um, members because, <clears throat> excuse me, myself as well as some of the others are showing that regardless to our age, we are redeemable. We are capable of conforming to society and being successful people. You know, we have positive thoughts. So I just ask that people join Carol with this fight, join us, and let's get these women out and allow them to rebuild their lives with their family, but more so with their kids. There's an old saying that we should be locking up people we're afraid of, not those we're just mad at. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. so, uh, right. I need Posey, we, anything, anything vital you want to interject? Yes, I want to uh, bring out a couple of barriers. Barrier number one, people still are not that well-versed on the dynamics of domestic violence. The first question we always hear is, why didn't she leave? Right. And people just don't understand how crippling and paralyzing the subtle steps of abuse are. Let me tell, ask you to talk about your own case. I mean, you, as you say, you were 40 years old. You had a good job with the state. You weren't 17. And you said you left this guy four times. How did you keep ending up back with him? Like I said, that... I, too, knew nothing about domestic violence. Right. Uh, and he knew all the right moves. Little did I know, before I met him, he was already a consummate abuser. Mm. So he knew the dance. He knew what it took to capture me. Therefore, he knew what it took to recapture me. He had done this before many times. And I was, I was green. I was fresh. I didn't know. I was 28 when I met him and had never, ever dealt with anything like this. Plus, I was still, when I met him, I was grieving the death of my mother and my oldest brother. So I was a prime victim, emotionally. Right. You're vulnerable. Exactly. And the other barrier is when these petitions go to the governor, it's after they've gone to the parole board, which is still manned by many of Ingler's appointees, who he said, life means life. He doesn't care. So... When they turn it down, when they give their reasons as to why um, they're not promoting this person for clemency, the governor's office doesn't really dig in and investigate themselves. They take the parole board's word for it. And they're just rubber stamping whatever the parole board says. So it's a catch-22, right. really. Can, can that, I share something, Debbie Posey? You, you asked her, many people want to know, why didn't we leave? Right. I left. My abuser threatened to blow up a shelter that I was in. What they don't understand is in that situation, a lot of times, especially when you're young, in your 20s or in your teens, it's based on your background, your right. upbringing. I had nowhere to go. My stepfather was an abuser. He was a drug addict, so I didn't have anywhere else to and go. And your abuser threatened to kill your six-year-old brother, as yes. you said. Yes. So that's a, mm, mm. You know, so they don't understand. And then Ms. Posey spoke on the parole board. Um the parole board, as she said, they're really not versed on what we do. You know, they tell us to go in there and speak the truth. Carol sat with me, and I spoke honestly at my parole board hearing, and I still stand. I accidentally killed my victim, and I've always said that if I could give my life to bring her back, I would. I was forced to sit in front of a parole board member in order to get my freedom. She said, I don't want to hear it's an accident. I had to literally tell this parole board member that I killed my victim because I didn't want no witnesses. That taunted me, and it still does, because I was made to lie in order to get my freedom. And this is the justice system that we're faced with, and it has mm. to stop. Or the, or the injustice system, yeah, is the case may that's be. that's right. Well, I want to thank you all for making this time. I admire so much what you do. And Carol Jacobson, um, 
you might argue that you've done more for society with the Michigan Women's Clemency <laughs> Project than you have as a teacher over all these years. But, <laughs> but uh, please keep it up and please, you know, keep us posted on how you're doing. You this, bet. This has all been fascinating, if a bit scary, and I want to, th again, thank all of our guests today for making time to do this podcast, and as well as all those who have listened and who have contributed to help keep these podcasts going. If you too would like to help continue this podcast on the air, I'd be thrilled if you'd send a contribution to me via PayPal or on my blog, LessonberryInc.com, or via <laughs> snail mail at Michelle and I probably still use letters, to Zing Media Group, 186 North, Media, <laughs> North Main Street, Plymouth, Michigan, 48170, or message me on Facebook or via my blog for more details. I'm far older, you know what, than, than any, anybody else here is. <laughs> so, again, please check out my blog, click the button, subscribe, and please come back and listen next time. This is Jack Lesnar with the Politics and Prejudices podcast. I'll be back with my final essay, and I hope to hear from you again soon. I'm not starry-eyed about people who are in prison. Some of them, women as well as men, have done very bad things. Regardless of how you feel about punishment, some do need to be incarcerated, either in a prison or, preferably in many cases, in a proper mental institution for the protection of society. But many of them don't. After reading about some of the Michigan Women's Clemency Project cases over the years, I'm convinced that many of these women received nothing resembling fair treatment during their trials and either should never have been locked up or got excessively harsh sentences. Some are very young women, girls really, who are pushed, brainwashed, you might say, into committing crimes or being accessories to crimes by older and abusive partners and boyfriends. Some were just there when murders happened and somehow got convicted of them. Some had very little idea how the legal process worked. Yes, many of them made bad choices in relationships, but who of us haven't? Who knows where we would be if we'd been in the wrong place at the wrong time? There's been very little justice for those who are in prison because of these legal miscarriages of justice. Politicians have to appear tough on crime, or at least think they do. Governors can commute sentences or issue pardons, but doing so is extremely politically risky. Historically, the only time they can usually be induced to show some mercy to the states forgotten is in the last few weeks of their final terms. And they don't even commute many sentences then. Not even to those of women, like Anita Posey, who shot their abuser to prevent them from killing their babies and themselves. Fortunately, there are a few, a few selfless and courageous people like Carol Jacobson out there fighting for the mostly forgotten, trying to get them justice too. Sometimes they succeed against the odds. They need help and support, but they need something more. Our laws about what constitutes self-defense should be revised to provide more protection for battered women. Police forces and prosecutors should be better trained to recognize the signs and nature of domestic violence. Judges and parole boards need to be better equipped to understand the, effect of the effects of domestic violence as well. We need a lot more understanding. Someone once said that we couldn't decide whether our prison should punish or rehabilitate, so we've invented a system that does neither one. It's time for us to grow up as a civilized society. We finally did get rid of the barbaric practice of sentencing minors to life in prison without any chance of parole. It's time we stop sentencing domestic victims to life as well. This is Jack Lessonbury. Thanks for watching and listening. See you next time.